Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Yes, we are here. Jack Curry from New Jersey, and it's a pleasure to be joined by Buck Showalter, who is in Texas, former Yankee, Diamondback, Ranger, Oriole manager, three-time manager of the year. Buck, first of all, thanks for being with us, but also, how are you and Angela and all of your family doing during this coronavirus crisis? Doing well, Jack. You know, it's a obviously a, a different world we're living in, and uh, sometimes I feel like I'm in a science fiction movie. And I know you and I have talked some off camera, but uh, you know, it's, my wife said we've been quarantined for 37 years. Thank God I live with somebody I like. You know, so uh, you know, just really doing our part and trying to make not only ourselves uh, out of harm's way, but uh, our fellow man. You know, it's, it's we have responsibilities. How are you doing, Jack? Well, first of all, I'm going to steal that line, except for Pamela and I, it would be 27 years. So I'm stealing that line as soon as this interview is done. We're, we're doing well, making all the smart decisions, Buck, that I think we all should be making. Stay at home. <laughs> be smart. Stay at home. If you go out for a walk or something like that, that's one thing. But be smart. Follow what the, uh, all of the leaders and the, and the medical people are telling us to do. And by the way, shout out to all of the people who are on the front lines and who are being selfless throughout all of this. Buck, I know you're such a detail-oriented, organized guy. Tell me something you've organized during this quarantine. There has to be a, a sock drawer that you didn't like the way it was looking or, or a box of books or something like that. You know, Jack, it's kind of like uh, we were talking the other day. It's kind of like the off-season. First week you get home from the seventh, eight-month season, you hibernate for a week. You don't want to see anybody. You just uh, barely talk. You just you know get your feet back on the ground in a different environment. But I've cleaned out every closet. All the things that I try to do in that four-month span, I never can get to everything. I've gotten to everything. We planted tomatoes yesterday. We, uh, we painted the uh, garage. Uh, you name it, we've done it. And uh, a lot of it revolves around grandchildren, too. That changes your life. But, uh, you know, I think I'm just about out of things to do. But I'm inventing a few, to be honest with you. Well, I'm, well, I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you could join us to do this. And Buck, I know the way your mind works, and I know you're not managing a team right now. But if you were managing a team, what would be some of the things that you would be doing right now in this time of uncertainty? Aaron Boone doesn't know the next time he's going to ride out a lineup card. He doesn't know the next time Garrett Cole is going to actually need to pitch in a game. But I'm sure there are things that a manager could be doing to help his players, to help himself, to help his staff. What would you be doing? You know, Jack, there's so much unknown. This is uncharted territory. It's like playing a game with nobody in the stand. It's like going to spring training and leaving and coming back. This is uncharted territory for a lot of people. I think the big thing is communication, staying in touch with people, using your coach to make sure there's an arm, an artery out to your players, regardless if it's a guy you're depending on every day or if it's someone you think is going to be a, a what if, because that can change. I think especially the pitching. You got to stay on top of that and find out exactly what they're doing. Um, I think the unknown is what makes them uneasy. I think letting them know what's coming, as you know, here's what I'm thinking about what we're going to do when we come back. Buck, within that last answer, you mentioned the idea of playing games with no fans and this uncertainty of 2020. That that's in the offing. You actually experienced that with the Orioles after the Baltimore riots. It, it was one game. I'm sure it was surreal. If that happens in 2020, what would that be like for players, for coaches, for a manager? I think, Jack, what hit me the game we played in Baltimore was, was how much of the game the players it, it, it runs up the emotion of the fans. I mean, it looks, you know, you have to be careful what you said to umpires. Everybody could hear everything. You can hear Jim Palmer at that point uh, doing the play-by-play, -play, the color, whatever you call it, and, and uh, Gary Thorne. Uh, there was no walk-up music. We played in like 205, 210. And I got to tell you, after the second inning, it was pure baseball. It was like the, the eighth inning of a game. It might have been extended spring instructional league. And it was good for a day. Don't get me wrong, okay? It was something we needed to do. And all the players kind of went, wow, that's kind of neat in a way because we played a pure game. It's not something you want to do day in and day out because there's a lot of times, Jack, you come off a West Coast road trip and you need that of fans. You know, knowing that something's important that you're doing. And uh, it was tough. I didn't have to call down the bullpen. I could yell down there. And it, it was not, <laughs> not something you want to see done every day. But, 
I know one thing the umpires liked it because it was a fast moving game with no arguments. Pure baseball. I love that phrase by you. And when I think of pure baseball and adrenaline, I think of opening day. Yesterday would have been opening day. And I think we all understand the importance of everything that is going on around us and the importance of making sure everyone's safe. But when you work within this baseball industry, opening day is, is such a day that you cherish and look forward to. You've been involved with so many. What, what are some opening day memories that stand out for you? Well, Jack, I, uh, you know, there are certain games that the Yankee manager, you wanted to be sure that, oh, I'll say it, you won. When you play the Mets in spring training, when you play the Red Sox in spring training, we used to have this thing called the Mayor's Cup, as you remember, where we would play exhibitions. Big game. Um, opening day was another one of those. You know, I always felt like, okay, the fans, it was like, like starting over spring, flowers are blooming, everything's new, and you want the fans to come and go, boy, I want to go back to that again. You want to put on a good show. That's really what spring training is. You're – rehearsing for a Broadway play that's going to run a long time, hopefully. And, you know, you rehearse everything down the spring, rehearse rundowns and relays and pickoffs and every little thing that bunt defense that might come up, uh, signs, so that when you put that Broadway play on, it runs smooth with some adjustments as you go. And I thought, I always thought opening day was uh, almost, hey, we're going to put this on and everybody's going to see what we've been doing. But I remember the first one I had as a manager, Jody Reed popping up and, uh, Wade catching the ball, it was, uh, I didn't think it was ever going to come down. I've been Charlie, i got to think about that, but uh, that was an attorney trying to act cool, even though, I mean, my chest was so, what my heart was coming through my chest, that, I didn't think that pop-up would ever come down. Breaking ball from Steve Clark. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I'm not surprised that you remember that specifically. I was at that game. I'm going to look up my, my game story later and get a few more details. Well, what about 2020, Buck? Both sides don't know what lies ahead of them. One thing that we've heard both sides say is they, they'd love to play a representative number of games. Now, in my mind, I hear that, and I'm thinking 100, 120, that would be representative to me. Do you have a number in your head that you think they need to play to constitute a representative season? Not really. You know, I think, obviously, and Jack, I know you agree with this completely. We've talked. It, it's about, you know, when we start, not, it, you know, where it ends. You know, we'll f figure that out later. You know, I'm thinking 100. I, I first was thinking anything over half a season, 81. I go back to the strike year where we went to camp with replacement players. And uh, I just, I think around 100. So, as long as every team's playing the same number of games, what difference does it really make? You know, to give validity to a season, we all face the same. I tell you, the sense of urgency, you know, hey, we're going through a tough stretch here. Oh, a tough stretch might put you in the Dixie Highway. You might want to make sure you don't have one of those. The other thing is we're probably going to see regular season games played in October. You're going to see postseason games stretched into November. They've talked about neutral sites because you, you could have snow in a northeast city in November. I, I think all that – is on the table, and I think, though, it may upset some fans, 2020 is just going to be that anomaly season where things are just going to always be different. In this situation, shut up and go, yeah, it's fine. Whatever's best for our country, our world, and uh, the game of baseball I'm in. You know, whether you're playing in a dome, whether you're playing – uh, in a central, you know, there's been a lot of thought, Jack, about having the World Series played at a neutral site every year in the central part of the country and put it on kind of like the Super Bowl. But I don't think, you know, I think our regular season means so much. And everything that makes the regular season matter, I'm for. But I think this is a different, this is a different cat. I, I think at the end of the day, if you have to play in a uh, covered roof stadium in November to finish a season, you know, just suck it up. There's a lot of worse things going on. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I concur with you. I think we're going to see some double headers, which players in the past have been against I got a teams. I got a question. Yeah. I got a question. What do you think about the seven inning games? And that's a great question, Buck. There are a lot of things in baseball that I don't think you should tamper with. The nine innings of a baseball game is one of them. I understand how extreme these circumstances could be, and I wouldn't stand on a mountaintop and say, no, don't play seven-inning games, but it almost seems to me that it could be trending that way, and 
And by the, the tone of your question, I think it sounds like maybe you'd be okay with seven inning games. Yeah, you know, Jack, it's one of those things you're okay in the minor leagues, but you're developing players. You're trying to keep from stretching pitchers out too much. Uh, it sounds good on the surface. A seven inning game seems to go by so much quicker than a, a one nine inning game. I'm talking about a double header seven innings. But I'm I'm with you. I think this is such a stat driven thing. I think you're better off playing less games and playing nine inning games than you are playing seven inning games and playing more. Just to say we played X number of games. I think you're asking for a some statistical things that you're going to uh, have a tough time offsetting. Buck, I want to have a little fun with you. We've talked a lot of the seriousness of what's going on in baseball. I want to hit you with a couple of names from uh, Yankee history. I want either the first word, phrase, anecdote, story that comes to mind. We're going to, we're going to do this rapid fire. How about awesome. Billy Martin? Uh, you know, I read some of these stories. I was thinking about this the other day. I think some of these coaches and uh, – they can't throw batting practice or hit a fungo in today's game. And that's how I got Billy's attention on the backfield. We used to have this big bazooka that she would pump up. You remember it, Jack, and it hit the balls up where the where – the, uh, shoot the balls up where the planes are. We were worried about in Fort Lauderdale knocking down one of those small jets. Well, the thing broke. And I'm a little minor league manager, 28 years old, from Oneana, and Cleet Boyer says, Billy, don't worry about it. Uh, Buck can hit fungos. I said, what? I've seen him work instructionally. He can hit batting practice. I'm, I'm like, oh, my God. Well, Jack, I got in a groove. The good Lord shined on me. I got on a groove, and Billy loved it. Hey, put one on the mound. He put one behind the catcher. Put one between the shortstop and left fielder. And I got to tell you, since that day, he thought I was pretty hot stuff. But the back part of that, I could hardly get out of bed the next morning. Doing this for half an hour, he wouldn't stop. <laughs> That's not Billy Martin today. I was thinking about it. I got something that somebody could even know batting practice. That's fantastic. How about uh, a guy you were a minor league teammate with? And then you later manage him, Don Mattingly. You know, it's funny. You're, you're hitting these names that I've had a lot of time to think. I remember Don coming up and saying, can I talk to you on the way back from Seattle after game five in the playoffs there in 95 and telling me that he was going to have to retire. That's mm -hmm. when I think of him, how sad that was for both of us and the guts he had to tell us that early where we could go out and make the Tino Martinez trade before everybody else knew that we needed a first baseman. That's, that's very typical Don Mattingly. Jim Abbott told me a story yesterday. Uh -oh. I'm going to speak to your Don Mattingly story with a Don Mattingly story. He said his first meeting with Mattingly was his first spring training, PFPs, pitchers fielding practice, on a backfield. A lot of times the, the person catching the ball at first base is a coach or, or an extra pitcher. He said there's Don Mattingly, an MVP doing PFPs with the pitchers and exhorting us to, imploring us to do better. And, and Jim Abbott said, I realized right then and there this guy was going to be a great teammate. Uh, Donnie, Donnie said, hey, put me in Abbott's group for PFP. I got to watch how he does this. It's one of the greatest things I ever watched in building position. Uh, Stick Michael. I got to hit you with Stick Michael. Uh, as wise a baseball guy as I think I've ever encountered, I know how close you were with him. Uh, two things. I remember, uh, you know, I don't think I was at the, on first on his list initially to manage. I got that one year contract and, but we were about the 10th day in spring training and he walked in my office and says, Hey, he's coming. Hey boy. He said, uh, you can do this. We're going to be okay. I've been watching. You can do this. Okay. See you later. You know what that meant to me? Jack? And he used to call me after every game, win, lose, or draw and go, Hey boy, you all right? 13 to two, we get beat. I oh, would we'll be fine. See you tomorrow. You need anything? We'll pitch it with a big box. We'll fine. The other thing he used to do, Jack, when he would call for rain, he had to make the decision. There were a lot of people running for cover. When he made the decision, he would turn his phone off, get in the car, drive home. The sun came out. He didn't care. He made the decision, don't call me. I'll see you tomorrow. You can suck a guess me tomorrow. It was beautiful. That, that's why Stick was as wise and as smart a guy as he, as he was. And man, we miss him dearly. Just a couple of more before we let you go. How about Bernie Williams? Uh, how mad he got at me trying to make him switch it down in the uh, extended spring. He was 17, 18. His dad had given me his number and said, Bernie's going to want to come home. He said he's probably going to, uh, if he gets frustrated, and he was really frustrated hitting left-handed. And I told him, I said, one day you'll thank us for uh, stick with it for another week. But if you want to go home, I got your dad's number. He said that you'd be wanting to go home. And <laughs> Bernie said, no, 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 don't call him. I'll try it for another week. 
And I got to tell you, about, I don't know, seven or eight years later, I saw him over in the Winter League, and he called me down to home deck, sort of, hey, thanks for switching. That's all you needed. That was pretty cool. But Bernie, Bernie was a beautiful man in a lot of ways and a great player. Uh, recent Hall of Fame, uh, soon to be inductee, Derek Jeter. Oh, jeez. Just uh, alert eyes. First time I saw him, his, his eyes were darting everywhere, and he was picking up things around him. He wasn't living in a tunnel. His mom and dad were so solid with him. And uh, he, uh, I knew that things that challenged a lot of players off the field in New York were not going to challenge Derek. And he was uh, – but he had some things. He wasn't a finished product. He was very raw. There were a lot of coaches. You know, he made a lot of errors in his, early on in his career, but he worked at it. He was going to be as good as he was capable of being. And obviously, it was pretty good. I think and let's close. So good. Yeah, 50, 56 errors, one minor league season. I remember Stick telling me about that, and he used a Mickey Mantle comparison about how Mickey Mantle had made 50-something errors in the minor leagues. But let's close it out with one more Hall of Famer, Mariano Rivera. Uh, extended spring structural league, uh, I didn't tell anybody. They used to get so bored. On, we used to, on the practice day with no games, we used to play a pickup game with the pitchers. And Mo was the best player. I remember saying to him, hey, this guy that can't pitch, because he's got no breaking ball, he's got a real stiff wrist, he can't get through the ball, and if he can't come up with another pitch, uh, you might want to try him in the outfield. He, he's like a man playing with shoulder. He's our best center fielder by far. Well, he found another pitch, Jack, and it worked out okay, huh? He, he found another pitch. He, he, he rode that cutter all the way to Cooperstown. And, Buck, uh, we, we go back a long way. Always a pleasure to talk uh, baseball with you. and. I'm very eager to have you back in the studio with myself, Bob Lorenz, John Flaherty. I thought we had some, some real fun times breaking down the Yankees in 2019, and I look forward to the chance to do it again in 2020. Jack, this was fun. Hey, blessings to you and yours, and uh, I miss you guys. We'll get through it, and I'll see you down the road. Sounds good, Buck. We'll talk to you soon.